And so one of these shortcuts is known as the availability heuristic, uh, which is very similar to this concreteness that we saw in the waste and card selection task. We like things that kind of come to mind, these specific examples, these anecdotes, these things we can visualize. Um, we don't like the kind of actual abstract statistics. So if I ask you, you know, which of these two is associated with the greatest risk of death? Nephritis, nephrotic syndromes, and nephrosis, or an airplane crash, okay? Well, most of us are probably not very familiar with that first set of uh, uh, conditions. And we are all very familiar with airplane crashes. They're very salient. They're very available and, and, and very concrete things that we can picture and visualize because we've seen them in movies, et cetera, and on, on news stories. If you look at the actual statistics, you know, there's all these different causes. Nephritis here is number nine at about 50,000, a very high level of uh, 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 death rate. Um, airplane crashes, you know, in, in 2017, I think we're, we're only 59 people ever. So in the entire year, just dramatically less likely cause of death. Um, and yet people are much more likely to endorse it because it's so salient, it's so available. And so again, we love these kind of concrete, vivid uh, things that we can picture this other kind of more whatever that is kind of thing. Even though it's much more dangerous, we don't really uh, think about that or reason about that very well. And a very related kind of heuristic is this representativeness uh, heuristic that we think about uh, things in terms of these kind of prototypical uh, cases. Uh, we rely on stereotypes. And so this classic demonstration here is the is Linda, the bank teller. She's 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. So you can really picture Linda, right? And, and then you're asked this question, what's more probable that Linda is a bank teller or that Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Well, from everything we've seen, you know, it just feels like, yeah, Linda's absolutely, she's going to be a feminist. I mean, that's just, yeah, that's who she is, right? And so we think this is much more kind of representative of who Linda is. It fits our prototype or stereotype of Linda much better. And so people endorse option B here, but logically it's mathematically impossible uh, for B to be more likely than A, because A is a subset of B, right? And so just from the basic rules of statistics, uh, if, if you have you know, one condition and then you have that same condition and a further condition, uh, if there's any chance that she's not in the feminist movement, um, this is gonna be less likely than this. And so mathematically speaking, B is never the right answer. A is always the right answer. But again, everybody says B because we reason concretely about these specific things that are familiar, that are representative, that are consistent with our prototypes. One of the most important biases that exists is the confirmation bias. And it's uh, pervasive, it's everywhere. So you see this in every kind of domain. Uh, astrology is basically one big confirmation bias where you know, no matter what the little fortune says or something, you are biased to find the things that are consistent with some aspect of yourself or some current situation. In politics, especially, everybody, you know, sees the information that's consistent with their views and sees that as a validation of their beliefs and kind of ignores all the information that's inconsistent with their beliefs. So the confirmation bias is also synonymous with the filter bubble, uh, this idea that everybody just seeks out information that is consistent with their beliefs in news and all, all other kinds of online media, everything is just tailored to reinforce your own existing beliefs. And so another name for this is belief persistence. Uh, people just basically ignore things that are inconsistent with their own beliefs and focus on everything that's consistent. And you know, there's two major factors going on here. One is that uh, we really are threatened by things that undermine core beliefs of our own. So we wanna be in control of our world. We wanna feel like we understand the important things about our world that, that matter. 
And if somebody says, no, you're wrong about something that's really important, that's very threatening, right? It undermines our feeling of control and, and the extent to which we sort of understand our world at some essential level. That's also reinforced with this uh, aspect of compression uh, that we have really built up these high level ways of understanding the world. And so it's actually physically hard to see things that aren't consistent with that set of representations, that set of encoding that we've developed to understand how the world works. And so both uh, control and compression are really important factors in driving this confirmation bias. So one of the most spectacular examples of this is in the uh, Saddam Hussein uh, weapons of mass destruction debacle, uh, where uh, you know everybody thought that Saddam Hussein must have these weapons of mass destruction, and in fact, they just simply did not exist. And you know, intelligence agencies and officers at the CIA, et cetera, uh, who, whose job it is to be skeptical and ha they have all these protocols to try to prevent these kinds of biases, nevertheless, uh, we're convinced that this was the case. So it really does happen. It's it's a very, very uh, pervasive kind of bias that affects all levels of decision-making and understanding in the world. Another important kind of cognitive bias is known as the gambler's fallacy. And it, it is this belief that basically you're gonna, your fortunes are gonna change. <laughs> and so you can see why it's called the gambler's fallacy if you've been losing you have the sense that, okay, well, I've lost enough, now it's time to win, right? People have the sense that randomness is such that, you know, everything's kind of evenly distributed. So first of all, there's always a 50% chance, like for flipping an even coin, a fair coin, uh, of getting a heads or a tail. So the statistics do not, in most real situations, depend on the prior history. And so that's a fallacy in and of itself, the idea that just because you have been losing, that that's going to change your current odds. Your current odds are basically always the same. Interestingly, there's this paper that I was involved in that shows that, in fact, there is some clumping of repeats relative to these kind of heads tail transitions. So the probability kind of if you look over uh, kind of time, even though the absolute probability is always 50 percent uh, at any given moment in time, there are these kind of clumpy uh, factors that cause a repeat of heads to be um, not evenly distributed with respect to heads versus tails. And this could be the uh, source of these gambler's fallacy type of beliefs.